Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're going to today be talking about uh, reaction mechanisms. And so I have a PowerPoint here that we're going to go over on reaction mechanisms, which is a big portion of this last fourth section of chapter 17. Uh, good news, there's not a lot of problems to do, at least not mathematical problems. They're just kind of uh, learning what a reaction mechanism is how it plays a role in uh, a chemical reaction and uh, the different parts of reaction mechanisms. And so <clears throat> your homework is gonna be a lot of like, you know, putting all that together. All right, so um, before I get started talking about reaction mechanism, I am gonna take a step back. Uh, and that's because um, I think in the last, uh, the last PowerPoint that I did or the last uh, lesson I did really, uh, it was more on the whiteboard. I got a little ahead of myself. Um, I, before we talked about uh, differential rate laws, uh, <coughs> rate, uh, rate, just rate laws in general, um, I, I would talk to you about instantaneous rates. And the reason I did that is because I think you got to know what an instantaneous rate is before you start putting together rate laws. Now, you could do it without knowing it. But um, I mean, what a rate law gives you is an instantaneous rate. The R in the rate law, R, you know, we have the equation R equals to K times the concentration of each reactant. And you figured out the, po the power to that. Um, so what that equation gives you is the instantaneous rate. So the first thing I did in that uh, lesson was to talk about what an instantaneous rate was. Well, your book actually covers it in this fourth section. So in a sense, we've covered it already, you, and you'll get some questions uh, for your homework on this, uh, uh, this part, but we've basically already talked about it. I did, though, want to point out uh, something so that you can kind of see this. So um, right now here we have, this is the, the, uh, the, the, the title slide to reaction mechanisms, but we're going to take a step back here. Um, so this uh, next slide right here basically is talking about um, instantaneous rates. And let me go ahead and point out a few things. So for a chemical reaction, you might get a graph that looks like this. The title of this is reaction progress, right? That means that as the chemical reaction progresses, what happens? And you're going to notice that the x-axis is time. So as time goes along, right, and you'll notice that the um, this x-axis is in seconds, and uh, as you can see, it's blocked off in every interval of 20 seconds. And on the y-axis is reaction con uh, reactant concentration. So one of the reactants, and they're not being specific here, if you had a chemical equation, you knew what the reactants were, they might tell you, you know, chlorine concentration or nitrogen dioxide concentration, whatever you were looking at, they might put it on here. But it's very common to have a <clears throat> graph that looks like this. Now, what you'll notice is usually what happens um, is that the reactant concentration will start at a certain level here. It starts off at 0.6. And as the chemical reaction takes place, the concentration drops. Okay. And obviously the reason why it drops, and I know some people haven't really thought about this because we've been doing these chemical equations uh, <clears throat> and uh, you know, balancing them and talking about chemical reactions, uh, doing stoichiometry, but people don't kind of think about, well, what is all that representing? What it's representing is this reactant is turning into a product. And if this reactant is turning into a product, it's turning into something else. So as the concentration, uh, as the reaction progresses, as time goes along while this reaction is happening, the concentration drops. And so as you can see, as you go from left to right on this graph, the concentration, this line right here, this blue line, is dropping, okay? And, you know, that's typical. What's also typical, you'll notice, is it's not a straight line. Because you'll recall that when we looked at the rate laws, the rate that you get at any point in time, the instantaneous rate, that R, is dependent on the co uh, concentration of your reactants. Um, so <clears throat> as you... Um, as your reactant uh, drops, there's less reactant available. And as there's less reactant available, the reaction rate 
uh, slows down. And because the reaction rate slows down, that means that the amount of, rea of reactant that you lose slows down also. So instead of going a precipitous straight line like this, what you get is a line that kind of starts sloping a little bit less and less. So it starts off with a large slope and ends up with smaller slope and you end up getting kind of a curve that looks like this, okay? And you'll notice that this graph here has a couple of um, little notes to it. Um, so normally you wouldn't see this right here, this whole thing here where it says, uh, instantaneous rate of T1, instantaneous rate of T2, you just see the curve, the light blue curve that we see there, okay? Um, what I want to point out is that <clears throat> the instantaneous rate really can be taken at any point in time, um, you know, by getting the slope of the tangent line to the curve. So you recall from geometry what a tangent is, and a tangent or tangent line is a line that only touches a curve or a circle at one point, okay? And so this right here uh, is a tangent line to, the, to our curve at this point. This point right here is at T1, which is at 20 seconds. So after 20 seconds, the, uh, we, we have a tangent line that will look like this. And so, You'll recall that we said that earlier, the rate of a reaction, uh, <clears throat> a reactant rate um, is basically kind of like the slope of this type of curve, right? You have concentration on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. So um, if you have your graph and you pick two points on a curve, let's say I'll go ahead and pick here uh, um, these two points and I, connect those two points, <clears throat> that is going to be the average rate between point one and point two. In this case, it would be the average rate between T1, which is 20 seconds, and T2, which is 100 seconds. Okay, so what you're calculating and what you calculated in your uh, problems before is the slope of this line, really, right? Because what you got was the difference in concentrations and you, subtract, you subtracted one concentration from the other. Uh, so whatever is 0.1 minus whatever is 0.42, let's say. And then you divide it by the difference in time, 100 divided by 20. And that gave you, um, that gave you the uh, uh, average uh, rate from one point to the other, okay? Um, so what these tangent lines are, are the same thing, okay? Uh, just imagine, two points right next to each other, maybe difference of 0.01 seconds. So you can barely see, you know, from here to here is 20 seconds. So 0.01 second, you can barely see it. But let's say you pick two points on there and then you made a line right through them, uh, you know, at 20 uh, seconds and 20.01 seconds. And you put a line right through them. Well, this is the line you'd get, right? And it has a slope. The slope of this line right here is the rate between those two points. But since those two points are so close, it's really like almost instantaneous, right? Between 20 seconds and 20.01 seconds, it's almost instantaneous. So really the average of two points that are so close to each other that the time is almost instantaneous, uh, that's basically an instantaneous um, <clears throat> rate right there. So that would be your instantaneous rate. That's how fast it's going. And if you plugged, or if you had a rate law and you plugged the concentration here in, you would get this slope of the line, right? So whatever the concentration here of this reactant was and the concentration of the other reactant, uh, at that point in time, you plug them in and you solve for R, the R would represent the um, slope of this line right here, right? It's the you know, change in concentration of your substance divided by the change in time, but you know, almost instantaneously. Same thing down here, uh, a tangent line at a second point will give you the instantaneous rate at the second point. 
And one thing I want you guys to notice is that the slope of this one is different than the slope of this one. Because, well, at different points in time, you're going to have different slopes. And if I were to put all kinds of different points up here, uh, you know, take a point, put it right here at about, you know, four seconds, and another one right here, somewhere in the middle of 50 seconds, each one of these points would have a tangent line that has a different slope from the others. Not maybe not that big, but a bit, not that big a difference, but they would be different. Okay, so that's what we're finding when we're finding instantaneous rate. You're finding, um, you know, basically the slope of the tangent point. By the way, what I what we just went over right now is like, I don't want to say half, but a good chunk of calculus. Um, that's what you're looking for. Um, you know, in algebra, you learn how to figure out the slope of uh, between two points that are usually pretty far apart from each other. When you learn calculus, one of the things you're going to learn is how to figure out the slope of um, at any point. And once again, the slope of a curve at any point is the same as the slope of its tangent line. Right? And, it's, and that's what we're doing in calculus. We're just making the intervals so small uh, between two points that you basically calculate a slope that occurs right at that point. Because you guys know, if you, if you have a first order uh, equation, right, which basically just a straight line y equals mx plus b, well, you get a straight line. Every point on that, on that curve or that line has the same slope. But once you get to x squared functions, x cubed functions, now you've got all these dips and ups and downs. And so every point of that is going to have a different slope. And when you take calculus one day, you will be go ahead and calculating these out. Now, the good news is for chemistry, you don't have to know calculus in order to figure this out okay, and do this. Uh, you'll be fine. But I did, did want you to know kind of that what you're doing here is calculus. Um, and you don't have to calculate these out. You basically use the rate law to do it. Okay. All right. So enough about rate laws and taking a step back. Let's go ahead and continue on and go back to the whole idea of reaction mechanisms. All right. So um, reaction mechanisms. What are reaction mechanisms? Well, basically what reaction mechanisms are show are th are a set of steps that shows you how a reaction, uh, chemical reaction takes place. Let's take a look at this chemical equation here, for example. This chemical equation right here says that we have uh, nitrogen dioxide reacting with fluorine to form uh, ni nitrogen dioxide fluoride, okay, NO2F. The question we have is, well, how does this reaction takes place? take place? Because, well, you know, you've, you know, uh, through your reading, you probably should have already read that when a chemical reaction takes place, it takes place because the molecules crash into each other. And, uh, you know, the more chemical, uh, mo the more chemicals around, the more molecules around, the faster it'll occur. So that's why the increase in concentration speeds up the reaction rate. What we have not talked about, though, is how that takes place, all right? So here in this reaction, we actually have three reactant molecules, two substances. But if you look at this, we have NO2, and there's two of them. So two NO2s react with F2 to form our two product molecules. So the question begs, how does this take place? Do the, all three molecules, the two NO2s and the F2, crash into each other at the same time? Or is there a collision between the F and the NOs and one of the NO2s first, and then a second one? Or do the two NO2s crash with each other first? Or does the F break apart first? There's all kinds of ways that this actually reaction can occur. It's very hard to get three things to collide with each other on their own. Sometimes that's the way things occur, but it's very hard. And usually when a chemical reaction depends on three molecules colliding with each other I, at, at ex exactly the same time, those chemical reactions tend to be pretty slow. Usually it's only two molecules or two substances or two uh, types of particles reacting with each other. I mean, if, if it's a chloride ion, for example, <clears throat> maybe the ions, uh, you know, part of it. Okay. So, 
our reaction mechanism is going to tell us. And here what we have is our mechanism. So these are the next two steps. This basically says that one of the NO2 molecules crashes with the F2. When it crashes with the F2, it kicks out one of the Fs, forming one of our NO2 Fs. And then it leaves an F by itself. Now, you'll recall that an F by itself has seven valence electrons and is not happy with that. So it needs to find somebody to get together with. So this F gets together with another NO2. And when that NO2 gets uh, now pulls that F, it forms a second NO2 F. Okay. So this is two steps. The NO2 uh, colliding with the F2, forming our, our first NO2 F, then making this, um, <clears throat> this ephemeral, this temporary uh, F atom. And then that F atom goes ahead and attaches to another NO2 to form our second one. Now, if you go ahead and add these two uh, steps together, we're going to call them elementary steps, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. <clears throat> um, you add these two equations together, there are two NO2s. All right, let me go ahead and get out here. There are two NO2s, there's an F2, and then there's an F atom on the left side. So if you look at both of the equations, everything that's on the left, if you put in one line, you have this. And then everything that's on the right, if you add those up, there's two NO2Fs and an F atom also. You'll notice like we did earlier with our net ionic equations way back at the beginning of the semester, um, that both sides have an F atom. And so since there's an F atom on both sides, we can go ahead and cancel them out. And when we do, we end up with the equation that we, that we who we'll start off with, or at least that we were talking about. I mean, you know, the, we, we didn't start off with, with this equation. This was the equation that chemical reaction that was occurring. We were proposed this mechanism with, that was made of two steps. And when you add up these steps, um, you should end up with your equation that you're looking for. Okay. So um, th that just kind of shows us how it all kind of the whole chemical reaction takes place. Um, one of the steps usually is slower than the rest. We call it the rate determining step. And I'll go into that in just a little bit more. Um, and we'll, we'll get into it a little later. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of things that we need to point out here. Uh, a couple of things you should know. Uh, first off is the elementary step. The term elementary step refers to a step that shows the react, the reactants turned, how the reactants turned the products in a single step. Okay, so it shows that, you know, here that the NO2 atom uh, molecule, sorry, the NO2 molecule crashed into a fluorine molecule. In an elementary step, it actually shows what molecules, what entities crashed into each other. So here, these two crashed into each other, forming these things. Now here, these two crashed into each other, forming, forming this over here. Okay, so um, that's what our elementary step is telling us. Our overall reaction, which we came up with over here, does not tell us that. If you just look at the overall uh, chemical reaction, it just tells us that, you know, it's bookkeeping basically. Uh, how we're gonna have two NO2s and an F2 turn into our two NO2, NO2Fs. But we didn't know how, right? We were asking that earlier. We didn't know how that was gonna occur. <clears throat> but now that we have a mechanism, we have a way of explaining, oh, how this occurs. Okay. And so, each of those elementary steps tell you uh, how we get from point A to point B, from point B to point C, et cetera, and so on. So that brings us to the second bullet point, reaction mechanism. Um, the reaction mechanism is the whole series of elementary steps that show how much how the chemical reaction takes place. Right? So this right here, these two steps, are the reaction mechanism for this overall reaction right here. The third term that we need to make sure that we uh, <clears throat> know is the term intermediate. What is an intermediate? Right, here's your intermediate word here. An intermediate is a substance that is formed in one elementary step and then gets used up in a subsequent step. It does not show up in the net equation. So our intermediate here was fluorine atom, just the F here. Here we produced fluorine in step one. And then that fluorine 
was used up in step two. So eventually it got canceled out and it does not appear in our overall equation. But it was uh, a chemical species that existed at one point in time. A lot of these intermediates, not all of them, but a lot of them are things that don't have an octet. They are not, um, they're not stable uh, substances. Um, and that's why they react and go on, you know, onto a subsequent step. Um, and that's why they get used up. <clears throat> but they still exist, at least for a small amount of time, that it helps the reaction go ahead and take place. Okay, so know your, what an elementary step is, <clears throat> what a reaction mechanism is, and what an intermediate is. Okay. All right. Now, let's get back to this whole rate determining step that I mentioned earlier. Uh, once again, I noted from the mechanism that the first step of the two from the mechanism was a slow step. Okay. Um, turns out that the slow steps are usually much slower than the other steps. I mean, I'm talking about hundreds of thousands to millions to billions of times slower. So when, you know, <clears throat> when one step is the slowest and it's slowest by a lot versus other steps, well, you know, basically the whole reaction is waiting for that step to take place. So once that step takes place, then the reaction go, can go ahead and proceed. It's kind of like, let's say you're going to go to Disneyland and you're going to get on, you know, um, I don't know, Space Mountain. And the line for Space Mountain is two hours long. The whole ride is only two minutes long, right? So if you're a whole you know, plan is to ride Space Mountain. There's two steps to it. There's waiting in line, and then there's actually riding the ride. What's going to determine how long the whole process takes? Well, it's how long the line uh, how how long the line is, right, and how fast it moves. So, um, you know, we're going to call that the rate determining step. If the line is an hour and a half long, then the whole process is going to take an hour and thirty two minutes. Right? And so that's what's determining how long it takes. If the line is only 10 minutes long, then the whole process will take 12 minutes. Right? So um, that's what's going to be, that's what everybody's going to be waiting on, how long it takes to get in the line. Okay? This whole reaction is waiting for this first step to take place. Then everything else happens really fast. So that's your rate determining step. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> since the rate of the rate determining step is the rate of the whole mechanism, um, and basically, uh, whatever the, the the rate or rate law for this rate determining step is, that's your rate law for your overall reaction. If you don't know the mechanism, you have to figure it out like we did, where you have to do experiments and you know divide by experiment three or experiment two, like on the last assignment. <clears throat> so if you don't know the um, um, you know the mechanism, or you don't know the, which one's the rate determining step, you have to do that. But if you know the rate determining step, you're like, oh, okay, well, uh, whatever the rate law is for this one, that's our rate determining step. And so um, here I can say, for this chemical equation, my rate law is R equals to K times the concentration of NO2 times the concentration of F2, both to the first power. Now, how do I know that, even though there's a two in front of the NO2 here? because this is the rate law I would get by looking at this first step over here. This is my rate determining step, right? The first step. So really what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go R equals two. And since there's only one NO2 involved in here, then I'm just gonna put NO2 to the first. And if uh, there's only one F2 involved in this uh, rate determining step, this first step right here, I'm gonna put it as a, a concentration of F2 to the first. Both of these are going to be to the first because the coefficients are one here. Remember, this only can be used, this process can only be used for a elementary step, not the overall reaction. Okay. All right, so that's a whole bunch of stuff on our reaction mechanisms. Um, how fast a reaction takes place has a lot to do with that um, <clears throat> With, with the mechanism and what intermediates or as they call it in your book, activated complexes you may have. We introduced you in chapter 16 to, um, to energy diagrams, right? 
So in this energy diagram right here, we have on the left-hand side, we have uh, NO2s and F2s, right? How much en enthalpy this would have. And then the product NO2F, how much enthalpy this would have. And if you recall, since the products here have less energy than the reactants or this enthalpy, this is an exothermic reaction. Okay, that's fine. But it has nothing to do with how fast reaction is going to take place. Exothermic, endothermic has no effect on how fast this reaction takes place. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, what does have an effect is how tall this little hill is. The top of the hill here is the energy for the intermediate or maybe sometimes it's called an activated complex where the NO2 and the F are attached to each other to kick out the, uh, to produce that intermediate. Um, this remember is an energy diagram. So the higher you are in here, the more energy it takes to get to that point. The higher this hill is, the less number of molecules that can get over it at a specific temperature. And in order to, for NO2 and F2 to turn into NO2F, they have to have enough energy to get over this hill. The higher the hill, the harder it is to get over it, and the less particles that get over it at any point in time. Now, some particles at first may not have any, but then they get kicked around a bit. Later on, they have more energy because they've been kicked around, and they make it later on. But the um, higher this is, at any point in time, the, low, the less number of reactants get over the hill. The lower it is, the more of them can make it over, right? So you don't need as much energy, so it's easier to get over. So a smaller activation energy, and that's what this E subscript A stands for. <clears throat> e is for energy, A subscript is activation. So this is your activation energy. The smaller this hill, the faster the reaction. The taller it is, the slower the reaction, okay? You, we kind of did that in a chemical, in, in, uh, in a sense, in a lab we did earlier in the year, you'll recall that we were burning magnesium. We get that bright flash from the magnesium. So think of, uh, remember there was magnesium reacted with O2 and it formed magnesium oxide. So at some point in time, you know, for the reaction to take place, the magnesium and the O2 have to collide with each other, forming this activated complex where the two are kind of connected to each other before the magnesium steals an oxygen from the O2, leaving an oxygen by itself. Normally, under normal room conditions, um, you know, you've got O being way up here, so most of the particles can't go over. So that's why you don't see magnesium, even though it's in the atmosphere with oxygen in it, um, you don't see it flashing. You, know, you don't see magnesium just flashing on its own. What we needed to do to get that reaction going, remember, is to put it in the Bunsen burner. And when you put it in the Bunsen burner, it heats up and then it flashes and it gets going. What you're doing is you're giving it the activation energy to get over the hump. Once you've heated up all those particles, their energy goes up, and so a lot of them get over this hump and become products. All right. So that's why you don't have to worry about holding the piece of magnesium. Even though it's in the air with oxygen, you don't have to worry about walking around with magnesium, and it's going to flash in your hand automatically. Um, but you have to heat it up in order to get the reaction going. It's still the same oxygen in the air that it was reacting with. It was just heated up by the Bunsen, heated up by the Bunsen burner. Um, <clears throat> which brings us to the last part here, catalysis. Um, catalysis has to do with the use of catalysts. So first let's define what a catalyst is. Catalysts are substances that speed up a reaction, but they themselves remain unchanged. A catalyst, uh, you can see, a, find a catalyst in a, in a reaction mechanism because a catalyst is first found as a reactant in a mechanism and then as a product in a subsequent step. In other words, a catalyst is used up in a mechanism and then spit back out later on. So it seems unchanged. It did go through a reaction, but then it got turned back into its original form. And so you can put a substance in as a catalyst. All you need to do is put a little smidgen of it, speeds up the reaction, and at the end of it, you can recover it. And hey, you know, you didn't waste any catalyst. Um, so, you know, catalysts really help chemical reactions um, speed up. Uh, <clears throat> if you took biology, you probably talked about enzymes, and enzymes are catalysts inside the body. Um, you know, in case, if you ever tried to uh, burn sugar, 
you know that, oh my God, that would take forever. I mean, I, I got sugar I can put on the table and it doesn't burn. It just doesn't seem to burn. But you know, you know, in your body, the way you get energy is by burning sugar. Well, how does it burn inside your body, but it doesn't burn uh, on the kitchen table? Well, that's because of the enzymes. Enzymes are catalyzing the reaction. So they're speeding up the chemical reaction. Um, and <clears throat> if you had to wait, uh, you know, in order for it to happen on its own, you'd be dead. You wouldn't have any energy. But the catalysts make this burning of sugar occur fast enough where you can go ahead and take energy from it and put it into ATP. So um, those are what catalysts are. Let me show you how a catalyst works. <clears throat> Usually, and catalysts work in different ways. Um, some of them just based on how they're set out, laid out. Um, <clears throat> some of them, what kind of surface they provide. But the most common ones in chemical reactions uh, are the ones that give an alternate mechanism. So let's take a look at this slide right here, and we'll see an uncatalyzed mechanism and a catalyzed mechanism. Okay, so the chemical reaction here is sulfur dioxide reacts with oxygen to form sulfur trioxide, right? SO2 plus O2 goes to form 2SO3. In the uncatalyzed mechanism, what happens is this. The SO2 combines with an O2, and that SO2 picks up one of the O's, to form the first SO3 molecule. And it casts off the oxygen with only six valence electrons. And see a little asterisk here in the upper right? It's not a happy camper, right? Um, we call it an oxygen radical. And radicals are unstable. <clears throat> and so since it's unstable, it'll go and jump onto the second SO2 and that'll form an SO3. The second step is actually pretty fast because this unstable radical is like, oh, I don't wanna be by myself. So it jumps onto an SO2. The hard part is trying to convert uh, to produce that radical to begin with. Now, we can get this reaction going much faster if we drop in a little bit of nitrogen oxide, NO. And when you drop in NO, the reaction takes place much faster. And down here at the bottom, um, we're gonna, we see how that works. If you go ahead and drop in an NO, <coughs> that N, uh, the NOs are going to go ahead and pick up an oxygen. They tend to pick, react with the oxygen much easier than the SO2. Do. So two NOs uh, react with an O2 to form two NO2s. Now those NO2s have an extra oxygen, which they can take or leave. Um, so it reacts with the SO2. Each NO2 gives uh, the SO2 an oxygen, and it forms an SO3. And you'll notice that uh, in the second step here, we produced our two SO3s we wanted, and then we found that there was, um, we're going to end up with NOs uh, at the end. So notice how this, these NOs that we ended up with were the ones that we started off with. Okay, so a lot of times people look at this mechanism and go, wait, isn't that an intermediate? And it's very confusing for some people because they know that, hey, look, we have NO on both sides, we can cancel it out. And that is true. Catalysts, you can cancel out just like intermediates. <clears throat> but the big difference between a catalyst and an intermediate is that a catalyst first is a reactant. You put it in there, right? It didn't come from anywhere. Uh, a, a, a intermediate was formed by one of the elementary steps. Well, this NO wasn't formed by any elementary step. You put it in there. And then it got spit back out at the end. And when it gets produced or spit back out at the end, then you can go ahead and say, oh, okay, I'll take my NO and go home again. Okay. Now, both of these mechanisms are two-step mechanisms. So just by looking at them, you go, well, which one's better? Which one's faster? Why would the second one be faster than the first? And just by looking at the mechanisms, it's not going to tell you. So um, what really tells you is uh, one of the energy diagrams. So if I were to go ahead and take these mechanisms and make an energy diagram for them, <clears throat> you'll see what the difference is. Okay, so uh, in both cases, since they're the same reaction, just one of them is catalyzed, the other one isn't, uh, they have SO2 and O2 as reactants, and they have SO3 as products. The uncatalyzed uh, reaction, remember we had to produce an O radical oxygen, so that's way up here, right? This little, this big hump over here is the, represents the activation energy of 
<clears throat> the uncatalyzed reaction because it takes a lot of energy to make this uh, oxygen radical. So you have to get the energy all the way up here. And this big old uh, arrow right here, double-headed arrow on the left here represents the activation energy of the uncatalyzed mechanism. In other words, the activation energy when oxygen uh, atoms are your intermediate or, you know, the activated complex. The, the activated complex is just when, you know, you're, you're making that, but they're all stuck together right before um, they separate. For the second one, the intermediate is NO2, and NO2 is a much more stable substance than oxygen. So the top of the hill uh, for the activation energy is uh, much lower. Okay, so this would be the hill for the second mechanism. And you'll notice that the activation energy is much lower, which means it takes less energy to get the reaction going. So if you put a certain amount of energy, let's say this much, right here, this reaction's going and a bunch of particles have this much energy. And for uh, if the uncatalyzed reaction, that's still not enough. In order to do to have the uncatalyzed reaction actually have an appreciable, appreciable amount of reactants turning to products, you got the got to get the energy way over here. And once the energy goes way over here and you start getting some of the SO2 turning to uh, SO3 at that temperature, well, if you had a catalyst, you would have, that would have happened much earlier, right? So it's just really looking at the um, intermediates and the activated complex that the intermediates create uh, from one mechanism to the other. That makes a difference in, um, in a uh, catalytic, um, a catalyzed chemical reaction, okay? Um, all right, so I hope that this has been helpful to you uh, to go along with your um, reading, please make sure you do the reading because they get into a lot of details. I've kind of given the overview. Um, hopefully I sounded better this time too. I actually got a microphone now. I was using the, the mics on the, um, uh, on the uh, um, uh, computer, the laptop, and uh, those would go in and out. So hopefully this one, I'm trying to see if it'll work better. Okay. All right. Uh, until next time.